first of all tavish and uh, pollen health care uh, team to give me this opportunity today uh, uh, my core interest lies into many specialities critical care being the prime most so i'm very happy to be here today so probably our fellow dietitian students and all of us should know in brief what it is and then take a decision on how to go about on it uh, the disclaimer this particular presentation is intended for educational purpose and does not replace any independent professional judgment of anyone and no conflicts of interest or restrictions related to the presentation while the learning objectives includes challenges and pathophysiology of critical illness that is very important to understand and the importance of nutritional support in critically ill patients benefits of enteral nutrition obviously we all know that it is important and why early enteral nutrition is important recommendations and guidelines which are the recent evidence based guidelines that we'll be talking about and not to forget um, uh, types of enteral feeds and some key learnings before we uh, finish the presentation to understand basically as dietitians or clinical nutritionists what are the challenges that we are facing in critically ill patients to achieve their optimum nutritional requirements is they undergo the patients in critical care uh units they undergo a lot of uh, various physiological and metabolic changes uh, uh, when they are being admitted in the icu setup and these changes definitely lead to an increase in the risk of malnutrition or already the patients who are getting admitted are uh, maybe mild or moderately uh, malnourished by uh, by itself so it becomes all the more difficult for us to meet the challenges uh, meet the requirements initially itself there is a reduction in the total calories and protein intake which complicates the uh, condition the clinical conditions and the outcome of the patient because the patient intake the, uh, the the patient's intake and the patient's requirement don't match up and that is where the complication starts uh, increase in septic uh, shock or rise in inflammatory biomarkers are these very common seen in icu setups and the metabolic imbalances basically results into mots shock and sometimes definitely mortality rate if not taken care of earlier so up to 60% of icu patients suffer even gi dysfunction which is very very commonly seen gi intolerances in our icu patients as well uh, due to impaired gi motility or uh, digestion or absorption such gi, GI dysfunction often coupled with inadequate calorie in intake leads to critically ill patients developing energy deficit and they start losing lean body mass faster to understand the pathophysiology of the critical illness see it's a myth if we say you know previously well nourished patients getting admitted in icu take several days for malnutrition to manifest but it is not so if understanding in a normal patient uh, normal person who is in a starvation mode the kind of process which takes place is ketogenesis comes into the picture and fat is utilized as a substrate for energy however in a patient who is in sepsis uh, in icu is the patient there uh, there the main uh, fat mobilization is impaired and glucose is not getting gen uh, generated in fact glucose is needed in more amount in these conditions and glycogen after the uh, liver is uh, liver glycogen is over uh, the the body starts looking at the uh, the process of getting it through the muscles the muscles have around 500 grams and there is where it start taking the glycogen and uh, breaking the protein so proteolysis is basically at the uh, maximum uh, and what happens is glycogen gluconeogenic pathway is into picture ketogenesis is not into the picture when the patient is in sepsis so much and it also takes a lot of days for ketogenesis to or ketosis to get into set into place so what happens here is lot of protein catabolism takes place and the patient is in a hypercatabolic phase the muscle mass starts to deplete well to understand if the body needs around 100 to 150 grams per day of glucose how it is being derived and how the body starts losing lean body mass around say 3.5 grams of glucose which means around 14 calories is derived from a gram of nitrogen which is also called as like 6.25 grams of protein and how much lean body mass is actually lost if we actually calculate 3.5 grams derived from 6.25 grams of protein but 150 grams of glucose which is minimum needed or say 100 grams is needed is derived from 270 grams of protein if dry weight is considered or uh, the muscle mass is 60% water so actually when we talking about 270 grams of protein 
at the cellular level, it is 675 grams of protein per day that the body is losing or the patient is losing. And that is where the truth actually exists as in previously well-nourished patients. PEM, which is protein energy malnutrition, occurs rapidly at the cellular level and sets in within the first uh, few days itself. Next is to understand the nutritional support. So the nutritional support definitely is needed because the patient is under stress, under acute illness, that is, uh, has got admitted with acute illness. Post-surgery, post-trauma patients definitely have more requirements and they also have major changes in their metabolic processes in the body. So the changes like in substrate utilization instead of fat uh, also being used up or glycogen being used up, it is use, using up the protein uh, more so instead of fat. Altered substance synthesis rates because there is more proteolysis and there is more gluconeogenesis which takes place or glycogluconeogenesis which take, takes place. Hypermetabolism or hypercatabolic hyper phase in the ICU which definitely you know makes us think about providing the nutritional support as early as possible to the patient. Understanding the major goals. Uh, which helps us to determine the nutritional principles is acute critical illness. Like we already spoke, the, uh, the degree of catabolism exceeds the degree of anabolism. So definitely we need to be thinking on our nutritional goals, keeping in mind, uh, mind carbohydrates are the preferred energy source since fat mobilization is impaired. Protein prescriptions are also in the hope of reducing the breakdown of muscle proteins into amino acids. However, even if we provide to uh, the requirements, we are not able to match up to the exact requirements of the patient. So it becomes all the more important. And then it serves as a substrate for gluconeogenesis. Phase of recovery is characterized by anabolism exceeding the catabolism. So when the patient is in the phase of recovery, then it begins, you know, um, uh, it begins definitely when the critical illness starts dissolving. And that is, again, one phase that we have to look at how to provide. So how it starts at the acute phase to the uh, acute, uh, later acute phase to the uh, recovery phase has to be thought of. Importance of nutritional support in critically ill patients? Well, definitely uh, nutrition support is very important because it helps in reducing the metabolic stress which is being caused, uh, metabolic response to the stress which is being caused by the inflammation. It helps in modulating the immune response of the body, prevents metabolic deterioration, and prevents loss of lean body mass uh, of, uh, of the body. Of course, it leads to decreasing in the morbidity rates and mortality rates, decrease in length of stay, the total cost of the healthcare, plus improves the patient outcome or the recovery. Now, we need to understand as dietitians that when the patient is getting admitted in the ICU, we need not overfeed or we need not underfeed the patient. We need to feed adequately. When in ICU, we know how difficult and challenging it is to meet the requirements or the targets of the patient's uh, requirements. It is very, very difficult. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, distractions or interruptions which happen during the patient's stay in the ICU. So what are the things that we need to look at and monitor? Uh, what are the things that we need to look at when we're looking at insufficient energy intake or excessive energy intake? For the early signs, we have to look at hypoglycemia or maybe hypothermia if it is setting in in the patient or if the patient is having higher episodes of hyperglycemia or hyperlipidemia, mostly triglycerides are being raised in the blood or hypercapnia. So we have to look at these symptoms. If it is delayed symptoms, in, in uh, we have been underfeeding the patient for a long time or overfeeding the patient for a long time, we can look for similar kind of uh, uh, symptoms symptoms or signs like infectious complications start arising. So there is immune, uh, impaired immune response of the patient, impaired healing processes. There's a very thin line. There may be loss of lean and fat body mass in an uh, underfed patient or impaired muscle function and muscle strength of the function. However, there would be liver steostosis because of increased triglycerides and lipids and increased fat mass in the body when we are uh, in the patients, when we are overfeeding the patients. Like I spoke earlier, there is a lot of GI intolerance which sets in in the patients who are in the ICU. Uh, so 
why is it important for us to talk about GI intolerances? We know about gut, brain gut uh, access and how GI intolerance will also be challenging for us because there will be forced discontinuation of enteral nutrition. We will not be able to provide it once gastric intolerance sets in or there is gastric dysmotility, which is a sign of disturbed yeah. GI function in the body. And intolerance to gastric feeding has been reported up to as 60% of the patient in, in the ICU, which is very, very high. Where do we see that generally, generally in patients who have changes in the body proteins, energy metabolism, definitely because the patient is in hypercatabolic stage. So the inflammation rate at which the patient may catch infections or inflammation is definitely higher because the patient is already admitted with it. There is delayed gastric emptying or abnormal motility patterns, uh, if we see, or impaired intestinal barrier integrity, then there is, we can say, GI intolerance in the patient. There could be a fear of complications of gastric reflux as well. So these are things, again, we need to keep in mind when thinking about GI intolerance in ICU patients and how it could lead to various con consequences. Is it could lead to diarrhea, it could lead to constipation. The first thing that happens in the ICU, a patient is seen with diarrhea or constipation, they start looking at the feed, what feed has been provided to the patient. And other than that, maybe diarrhea, the frequency in the ICU may vary from 2% to 95%. Uh, if it is constipation, if you say there is a delay in enteral feed in 50% of the patient just because of constipation, if you see, because there is a delay in feeding of the patient in the ICU. Malnutrition definitely sets in. It increases the length of hospital stay of the patient by at least four to five days. And what happens is there is impaired gut function significantly, which compromises the delivery of enteral nutrition, resulting into uh, increased hospital stay of the patient. Well, understanding with this particular study, it was seen that 30 to 70 percent, like I said, uh, ICU patients had GI dysfunction. And what we need to understand is pre-morbid uh, pre conditions like TBI, ventilation mode patients are studied, altered metabolic state patients like having inflammation or sepsis or circulating stress hormones or gut hyperperfusion patients were seen, which means altered metabolic state. ICU medications like the patient being on catecholamines, or sedatives, opiates, etc. They found that also GI dysfunction happened in patients uh, who were 50% of mechanically ventilated patients. So it is very important for us to understand uh, the GI function in ICU is as compromised as it looks here. And this is all, uh, all the criteria that we have to look at, especially patients here. They are more, um, uh, they're more prone to get GI intolerances. And GI dysfunction coupled with inadequate intake of nutrition would lead to malnourishment. When we say malabsorption, intolerance and leading to calorie energy deficit. 74% of uh, mechanically ventilated patients failed to attain 80% of their energy targets. This is uh, what this particular study spoke about. Nutrition in ICU basically, uh, what we see is uh, when the patient gets admitted, if the patient is taking orally, if the gut is functioning, then well, fine. We can otherwise start enteral nutrition if not, a uh, patient is not able to take orally. It's a preferred method of providing nutritional support to our ICU patients and definitely more preferred than parenteral nutrition because obviously it is very simple, causes fewer complications and side effects, lower co cost than compared to parenteral nutrition. And the ability to protect the intestinal mucosal barrier or intestinal integrity is better. So uh, uh, we need to be considering enteral nutrition prior to PM. However, there are limitations to it as in uh, feeding intolerances usually occur during enteral nutrition, leading to adjustments uh, or discontinuation of the enteral nutrition. Uh, when nutrition intake, nutrient intake does not meet the body's metabolic demands, it, start, it can lead to malnutrition. The patient starts developing malnourishment or is at a higher risk of malnutrition. Now, when we're considering ICU patients, we cannot just stop without talking about patients who are in a post-surgery or post-trauma or post-sepsis. What are the few things that we on one needs to keep in mind? They are quite similar because they are as per the ESPEN and ASPEN guidelines that I've taken here. Surgical patients, post-trauma patients start enteral nutrition early using a high-protein polymeric diet for trauma patients. 
consider an immune modulating formula with arginine or fish oils in severe trauma cases. However, if it's a TBI case, traumatic brain injury, start in within as early as 24 to 48 hours of the injury. It is definitely going to show better recovery of the patient and use an immune modulating formula or supplement, uh, you know, having EPA or DHA. Open abdomen or major surgeries, patient with major surgeries, it is very important to determine the nutritional risk right at the initial phase and start enteral nutrition within 24 hours of surgery. In the absence of a bowel injury, uh, start enteral nutrition as early as within 24 to 48 hours post the injury. Now, when we consider sepsis or the patient is in septic shock, it is very important to know that the patient is hemodynamically stable prior to starting uh, our intervention. So start enteral nutrition within 24 to 48 hours of diagnostic uh, diagnosis when resuscitated and avoid parenteral nutrition in the acute phase of sepsis regardless of the nutritional risk. The main uh, preferred choice uh, uh, would be definitely enteral but in acute phase avoid a parenteral uh, even, even though there is a nutritional risk involved. Trophic feeds is something that probably can be started with patients in septic shock. So it could be as little as 10 to 20 ml probably can be started as trickle feeds. And at the, during the initial phase of sepsis, probably something which is lesser than 500 kilocalories per day can be started. There, our main concern is not reaching the targets, but our main concern is to move the gut. Um, advance after 24 to 48 hours to more than 80% of the target over the first week of feeding the patient. Of course, the protein requirements could be 1.2 to 2 grams protein per kg per day and can be calculated according to this. So what does the international guidelines on nutrition talk about? If we consider ASPEN or SSCM, which is Society of Critical Care and Medicine, 2016 guidelines talk about energy requirements being 25 to 30 kilocalories per kg per day. That's our thumb rule that we use. In patients who are obese, which means the BMI is between 30 to 50, we need to use 11 to 14 kilocalorie per kg uh, adjusted body weight per day. And if the BMI is more than 50, uh, you can calculate uh, probably 20 to 25 kilocalorie per kg ideal body weight per day. Similarly, ESPEN guidelines also talks about obesity, uh, then 20 to 25 kilocalories uh, per adjusted body weight per day. Uh, protein requirements at the, the ASPEN uh, guidelines say 1.2 to 2 grams per kg per day. If the BMI is between 30 to 40, then 2 grams per kg ideal body weight. If the BMI is equal to more than 40, then up to 2.5 grams per kg ideal body weight per day. And similar to that, ESPIN uh, says 1.3 grams per kg per day. And uh, uh, what, when it should be commenced, I think both are quite similar, that it should be as early as possible within 24 to 48 hours of uh, the patient getting admitted. Recommendations from uh, Indian practice guidelines uh, are enteral nutrition should be started as early as possible, preferably within the first 24 to 48 hours. Tube feeding should be considered if even 50 to 60 percent of the nutrition targets are not met adequately within the first 72 hours of oral nutrition support. And if the nutrition requirement is not met adequately with EN also, even after seven days of ICU admission, then probably uh, use of peripheral, uh, uh, partial parenteral nutrition may be considered, supplemented. Importance of micronutrients, it is very important to understand micronutrients. Uh, well, if our patient is having balanced uh, or uh, an optimum complete balanced formula feed, then probably we may not need the additional micronutrients, trace elements and vitamins. But uh, pre-existing micronutrient deficiencies needs to be assessed and evaluated probably by your consultant or doctor as well and could be supplemented in patients maybe who are on blenderized feeding, uh, who are using blenderized feeds in their hospital setups or those who are on parenteral nutrition. The preferred route of nutrition is very important. Definitely we prefer if the gut is functioning, enteral nutrition is preferred over parenteral uh, as early nutrition in ICU patients. Supplemental PN uh, at the end of first week of uh, admission in ICU is advisable. When food enteral uh, nutrition support is not possible or it, it is, uh, you know, it fails to deliver the energy targets up to at least 60%. However, combination should not be uh, routinely recommended except for basic uh, specific 
indications which may be an unconscious patient like of a head injury ventilated patients swallowing disorders which could be some neurological disorder of say physiological anorexia in liver cases upper gi obstructions with some strictures or obstructions uh, partial intestinal failure uh, like uh, ibd or short bowel syndrome uh, increased nutritional requirements like renal diseases or psychological problems like severe depression or anorexia nervosa so in these cases probably we could be looking at even a combination uh, but otherwise routinely on a routine basis there it is not recommended to understand the uh, you know nutritional management uh, in terms of the nutritional status of the patient what is the nutritional status first we need to screen the patient we need to assess the patient based on the various tools which are available now we also have an iap in tool which is uh, recently been uh, come up with some screening tool uh, uh, other than i think sga which is being prominently being used and is the gold standard to be used Uh, or in rs 2002 so once we have assessed the patient and we know the patient is well nourished or moderately malnourished in the acute phase we try to consider enteral nutrition and not use parenteral nutrition our energy targets would be somewhere less than 70% estimated or measured which means we know the target and then less than say 70% is what we need to start with protein targets definitely except the protein dose provided by delivering the energy target so that our protein is uh, not being used up for uh, uh, the, the proteolysis which is happening our proteins are being used up for building on and we are not losing on the lean body mass that is important so we have to keep the targets in mind severely malnourished patients follow management for well, well nourished patients that is important one and closely look for signs of refeeding syndrome especially if we see hypophosphatemia or even low levels of uh thymine if uh, phosphate is low replace uh, keep energy in target to less than 50% requirements for the initial first 2 to 3 days before gradually increasing it and in the acute late phase we need to keep in mind it has to be enteral nutrition definitely pn if en is contraindicated only in those cases it depends on case to case an energy target could be between 70% or 80 to 100% estimated measured requirements we need to gradually increase the proteins to 1.3 grams per kg per day in case of severely malnourished patients it is similar but we continue to be watching for the signs of refeeding syndrome recovery phase when the patient has been in the icu for more than 7 days probably we have to look at the recovery phase and in the same also we provide enteral nutrition as a first choice commence pn if en is contraindicated or insufficient and then try to reach the target 80 to 100% uh, by either using ic which is indirect calorimetry or by um you know by uh, thumb rule or predictive equation because we presently use that only we don't have indirect calorimetry at our setup so uh, nutrition monitoring in critical care how important it is not just to write it but also to monitor is, is important what are the things that we needs to keep in mind identification of patients at risk of feeding intolerance will help in development of strategies to monitor and manage nutrition intolerance and reach to their targets so that will help us only if we are monitoring it right so this will ensure adequate delivery of nutrients to our icu patients what are the recommendations for the same uh, first is gastric residual value it should be measured by syringe aspiration and not by suction pump that is very important and if it is used it should be less than 300 ml uh, if it is less than 300 ml then it can be refed if it is not blood stain uh, holding enteral nutrition for grvs less than 500 in the absence of other signs of intolerance should be avoided this is as per the guidelines however uh, every hospital has their own local policy or set policy for it uh, it could be a cut off range between 300 to 500 ml which can be considered in case of high grvs efforts should be made to continue feeding with reduced volumes prokinetic agents could be used like erythromycin or metoclopramide uh, can be recommended for the patient intolerance and risk of aspiration of course nurses should be trained well for monitoring intolerance um, at present we are using we have uh, uh, put up an icu alert guideline where we have we have put up posters in our icu and where it talks about the elevated bed the uh, evaluation of the grvs 
all those things uh, in the chart itself. And we keep training the nurses about the same, how it has to be given, how the feed has to be reconstituted, which we do at bedside in our, our ICU setup. So all those points have been considered there to have safe and hygienic practices also while having enteral nutrition for our patients. Nutrition protocol for ICU, basically one needs to keep in mind. This is a kind of a busy slide, but I would just put it as, you know, uh, we need to have an ICU bundle, nutrition ICU bundle in place, wherein we need to be talking about once the patient is hemodynamically stable, then we are definitely looking at the nutrition protocol. When we are looking at that, the first thing that should come into mind is the screening of the patient and the assessment of the nutritional status of the patient. After assessing the patient for malnutrition, probably we can calculate and plan our requirements of the, uh, of the nutrients, how and what we have to plan for the patient. Once we know that this is the target for today, or if your patient is taking orally, excellent. If the patient is not taking orally and we have to shift to enteral nutrition, whether it can be started, no, it cannot be started, then we need to start parenteral nutrition. We have to talk to our consultant about it. If we can start enteral nutrition, then we have to talk about if it can be oral and enteral or just enteral nutrition. We could start with having where is the root, uh, what is the root, where is the tube being placed, and uh, how much is our uh, targets that we have to reach to. Depending on that, the condition of the patient and what kind of uh, you know formula will you suggest to the patient, the planning and uh, uh, calculation of all those things. Once you've planned your uh, nutrition care plan for the patient, then probably your monitoring and evaluation comes into the picture and your progressively reaching the goal is, becomes important. So what is important is starts, uh, uh, you know, with 60% to 70% and then gradually increases progressively to normal feeds. We can start with standard polymeric formulas. We don't really have to stick along to any specific formulas all the time. And trophic feeds of 10 to 20 ml probably could also be started in case we see any kind of GI intolerances. Um, other than that, continuous uh, monitoring, continuous evaluation of it and managing the nutrition requirements of the patient becomes extremely important. In case we see any kind of gastric, uh, any kind of aspiration in the patients, the use of prokinetics uh, or head uh, uh, of the bed to be elevated to 30 to 45 degrees becomes important. Use of post pyloric root of feed, if needed, has to be considered. Maybe to avoid VAP, use chlorhexid in mouthwash. All these things probably are also taken care of by the nurse. But these things are things that we need to also monitor along with our nutrition calculation. Now, why to start early nutritional or enteral feeds in ICU patients? Definitely our study and a lot of studies and data says that malnutrition in the ICU ranges from 38% to 78% and independently associated with poor outcomes or poor recovery of the patient, increasing the length of stay of the patient in the ICU. One third of the patient getting admitted in the patient hospital are in the malnutrition condition in developed countries, whereas one third hospitalized patients become malnourished during the hospital stay. So it is as high as that. And, uh, you know, uh, the patients uh, averagely lose around 2% muscle pro proteins per day with understanding how much is the protein requirements in the ICU. Comorbidities significantly increase the ratio of readmissions of the patients, included weight loss, iron deficiency, anemia, or mal malabsorption and malnutrition sets in. What are the factors one needs to keep in mind when prescribing enteral nutrition in critically ill patients? Well, limitation of microbial contamination of feeds. We need to be taking care of bacterial contamination by having safe and hygienic preparations and reconstitutions of the feeds. That is very, very important. Meeting adequate nutritional needs safely. So the planning is important and not just the planning on the paper, but if the patient is receiving it or not. So that in case of any distractions, disruptions or interruptions, we need to make sure that we are adjusting and the patient is also achieving what the patient is losing and we are trying to compensate that. Ease of use and convenience for the nurses because the nurses are, are the most busy person when it comes to ICU or ward. They are taking care of each and everything. So we need to keep in mind as dietitians, as hospital dietitians, that we are planning uh, the timings or the feeds as per their convenience and comfortability. So our patient gets it and it doesn't get delayed because of their work timing. So we need to be planning. And every hospital, I'm sure, has 
some plans for it. Cost effectiveness is very important because the patient is undergoing um, and the healthcare costs are so high, then we need to be considering even cost effectiveness to see that we are providing the patient uh, adequately with cost effective uh, plans or availability of these. Types of enteral feeds. Well, there is bl blenderized foods and there are scientific foods. When it comes to blenderize, it is our old traditional, fa old fashioned uh, feeds, kitchen feeds, wherein we try to uh, blend, uh, you know, rice or we try to blend dal and rice. We add oil, we give milk, we used to give buttermilk and lassies. But these are all things which are old now. And the latest, uh, the, the current guidelines, which are not so current, they have been old enough for us all to implement it already in our hospitals that we should be using scientific formulas because they are claiming to be advanced but they are not actually advanced they have a lot of limitations especially that they can be having high uh, microbial or bacterial contamination chances or risks okay inconsistency in the amounts in the supply of nutrients is 16 percent to 50 percent uh, the person who's making it the cook who's making it variability in it check of it uh, is very very important which is not there even the consistency changes and the texture changes high osmolality and viscosity possibility of a blockage of the feeding tube again causing a lot of inconvenience in uh, for the patient what are the potential contraindications for the same acute illness or immunosuppression greater risk of infection from contaminated food which can result into fluid restrictions may be difficult to meet nutrition uh, nutrient needs or uh, if there are fluid restrictions in the patient you'll not be able to achieve it and that is going to deteriorate the condition of your patient with having a long-term stay in the hospital continuous feeding requires formula to be uh, probably unrefrigerated for several hours so all that has to be kept in mind how is the feasibility? Definitely, it's not a, uh, you know, go kind of a situation. We have to look at enteral uh, scientific formulas. So when we talk about scientific formulas, there are many. Uh, we can, you know, pro probably put them into the group of polymeric, uh, disease-specific, oligo oligomeric, uh, immune-modulating and modular products. Well, what we use in our setups are the uh, balanced, complete polymeric formulas. They are they contain whole protein or intact protein as a nitrogen source, and they can the content of these products could vary greatly in terms of caloric density, macronutrient distribution, amount and type of uh, fiber being added into it, or vitamin or mineral, and electrolyte composition. Also, uh, the subtypes could be standard, high protein, energy dense, fiber enriched. So standard could be used for normal GI function. Nutrient distribution is as good as, you know, normal diet. High protein could be protein would be more than 15% of the total energy being provided. And it could be used in wound healing cases or probably uh, catabolic states, uh, trauma cases. Energy dense could be 2 kilocalorie per ml. So all are 2.0 products, which are their scientific formulas, probably would be the energy dense ones, especially could be used in patients who have fluid restrictions and electrolyte imbalances. Fiber enriched would be 5 to 15 grams. Bowel function disorders, where we can probably use these as well, a part of uh, uh, the, the plan that we have, whatever you're giving. Along with that, you can add on the fiber enriched ones as well. Next is oligomeric. So when we talk about oligomeric, these are proteins which are hydrolyzed to peptides or amino acids elemental or probably a combination. Generally, we, what we have is a semi-elemental based one. And composition would vary again here. One or more nutrients are hydrolyzed and suitable for patients with extensive impairment of gastrointestinal function. Generally, it is suiting with patients with any GI dysfunction. Uh, also pancreatic disease or diarrhea persistent malabsorptive diseases so definitely the absorption or the bioavailability is better if you use this product there disease specific it could be renal hepatic pulmonary diabetic etc it depends on if you have a renal failure case less protein low electrolyte we can go for renal case uh, specific uh, formulas if it is hepatic NCAF, probably high branch chain amino acid and lower aromatic aromatic amino acids low electrolyte one could be used ARDS uh, definitely higher fat content and uh, high probably protein moderate uh, carbs could be used diabetes mellitus a low carbohydrate low supplement could be used it again has a contents which would greatly vary in terms of calorie density and macronutrient distrib uh, distribution amount of fiber or vitamin mineral uh, 
uh, and electrolyte composition. Now, next is immune modulating. These are ones probably which have combination of pharmacologically active substances such as arginine, glutamine, omega-3 fatty acids, linolenic acid, nucleotides, antioxidants. And they are intended to modulate the immune response or the function of the body. Now, with these molecular products contain predominantly one nutrient and they could be used, probably protein, carbs, lipids or fiber. Coming to bovine cholesterol and its effects on critically ill patients. Now, to understand what is bovine cholesterol, whether we use it or not, is a different aspect. But as our, you know, as in dietitians, we should just know about it because there are many products which are coming up with bovine cholesterol now. So, what is it uh, is one thing. Uh, bovine cholesterol is the first milk which is produced after birth. Commonly referred to as baby's first milk or biological soup. It's a rich source of macro, micronutrients and immunoglobulins peptides with antimicrobial activity and growth factors. You can see the difference between a uh, cholesterol milk and the whole milk, which is on the 11th day, how it is differing, the total solids or the total proteins, it varies how much. So it varies at least three times to 3.5 times in proteins, immunoglobulin, six times it varies. So definitely it is higher in that. And that is what is probably needed in ICU patients is what is thought of especially for GI intolerances patient or our respiratory distress patients. What makes bovine cholesterol so beneficial? Well, there are over 90 known components in cholesterol. The primary components are divided into two classes mainly. One is the growth factors and the other is immune factors. These are two important prime factors. And cholesterol has precisely balance of vitamins, minerals, amino acids in a perfect way to have uh, synergy to restore and maintain health. These are particularly the nutrients which are found in bovine cholesterol. Um, some vitamins and minerals which are mentioned here. B1, B2, B3, B6, pyridoxal, uh, B7, B12, vitamin C, A, B, E, e and K. Uh, minerals like calcium, uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium, zinc and copper. Uh, sugars would be lactose and oligosaccharides. Again, proteins would be caseins, whey proteins growth factors, cytokines, uh, all immunoglobulins are there. Glycoproteins are there like lactoferrin, which is extremely um, important. Lipids, again, uh, all sorts of lipids, whether it is short chain, medium chain, saturated fatty acids, or uh, whether it is conjugated linoleic acid, mufas and pufas, etc. They all are definitely giving us a nutritional, constructive and energetic perspective and they are helping in immune modulation functions in improving the immune response of the body have antioxidant effects and also act as prebiotics so uh, lactoferrin which is the prime most important uh, glycoprotein from bovine cholesterol has so many functions by itself of course immunomodulation that's its prime function inhibition of immune response which is anti-inflammatory and stimulation of the pro-inflammatory state uh, ability to uh, chelate iron, which is very important. So participation in iron absorption and metabolism from the intestine or participation in redox, inhibition of pathogen or bacterial growth is what it, uh, how it helps. Antimicrobial activities against bacteria, fungi, viruses, etc., And other activities by inhibiting tumor growth, wound healing, regulation of intestinal functions, prebiotics, etc. Also, one study also mentioned about uh, a study which was in 2023, only I came across this particular uh, paper, wherein it actually showed about, uh, you know, what are the various medications probably being used up in the ICU, antibiotics, sulfonamides, infection care, may, uh, probably NSAIDs in inflammation, fever and pain care, corticosteroids in inflammation care, psychophysical stress related medications. Now, these are things which are already being there in the ICU setup. So what we think is probably the effect of bovine cholesterol being systemic uh, effect on antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, antipyretic and analgetic agent in that mainly the lactoferrin and the bovine cholesterol by itself has uh, probably a um, preventive effect against the adverse effect which is shown by these medications. Like medications like antibiotics may have abdominal pain, diarrhea, uh, maybe gut dysbiosis, etc. NSAIDs would have renal, pulmonary, liver, neurological effects and damage of gastric and intestinal mucosa. Corticosteroids and other uh, stress-related medications would impair the immune system or cause injury to it. Gastritis is very, very common with it. 
So these uh, lactoferrin derived peptides or these lactoferrin yes. and even bovine cholesterol and other um, uh, bio constituents of it help in preventing and supporting uh, reducing the side effects of these medications. So there again, it shows a little positive uh, effect. Now, just to understand the immunoglobulins and their effect, obviously we know that immunoglobulin is going to have a better immune response in the body. So IgG neutralizes toxins and including viruses, bacteria. IgM destroys bacteria. IgD is again an antiviral. Uh, it is involved in hemolytic dynamia, uh, disease in infants, prevents immunoglobin E uh, generally involved in regulating allergic responses, highly antiviral and antibacterial. Uh, when it is IgA, again, mucous membranes helps in maintaining skin uh, and protects against any kind of infections. When it is lactal albumins, it raises brain serotonin levels, improves the mood under stress levels, also shown to cause lung cancer cells to create selective suicide apoptosis. So apoptosis, as in we probably have the cell uh, cancer cells, you know, uh, dying, and it helps in uh, probably more increase in the cancer cell synthesis. So there we can have a uh, look at this use of this particular uh, component of bovine cholesterol. Cytokines again uh, is uh, including interleukins or TNF or lymphokines, antiviral increase in T cell activity. It helps in uh, having a pro-inflammatory response, improves the immune response by regulation and intensity of it and stimulates the production of immunoglobulins in the body. Again, lactoferrin, it's a powerful antioxidant, antiviral, antibacterial, and anti-inflammatory. So these are components of bovine cholesterol. This particular was a study uh, that I found, uh, probably a 2018 paper, in effect of early enteral bovine cholesterol supplementation on intestinal permeability in critically ill patients. It was done basically a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. The objective was to understand uh, how it affects the, inter, um, uh, the effect on intestinal permeability, which they studied by understanding the plasma levels of zolunin. This is again a protein uh, which is found in the intestinal lining, glucosa. So what they found is results showed that bovine cholesterol supplementation was able to reduce the plasma zolunin level, which generally increases during the inflammation. A study also reported 20 days of bovine cholesterol reduces stool concentration of zonulin in athletes. And uh, intestinal permeability, uh, it showed in subjects whose intestinal permeability rises due to various pathologies and helps restore gut status after the use of antibiotics and NSAIDs, both of which can increase uh, in intestinal permeability. So it showed a reduction in that uh, when used bovine cholesterol. The majority of ICU patients uh, have at least one of the GI symptoms during their ICU stay, which we have seen also. Results have shown that enteral bovine cholesterol supplements reduces the incidence of diarrhea. In this particular study, uh, bovine cholesterol was significantly more effective in prevent, uh, protecting healthy adult uh, volunteers against the development of diarrhea caused by E. coli. Uh, bovine cholesterol has been reported to positively influence infective diarrhea also, both in human and animal studies. There was another study that I found, uh, this particular study, uh, early enteral nutrition with bovine cholesterol in critically ill patients. Now here particularly the conclusion was um, results provide evidence that bovine cholesterol supplementation had beneficial effects on intestinal permeability and gastrointestinal complications in ICU hospitalized patients. It's again one of the studies or the papers related to the previous study, uh, both uh, uh, in respect to intestinal permeability. Next, I found uh, one more, which was in 2021, bovine cholesterol application in sick and healthy people. It was a systemic review, basically. So what it showed was that particularly it was conducted to update current knowledge on bovine cholesterol effects during all administration routes on healthy and sick subjects. And what they found was that uh, it highlighted multiple clinical applications of bovine cholesterol and confirmed some general benefits on intestinal and respiratory recovery in absence of adverse effects. And bovine cholesterol seemed to promote immune system enhancing and modulating local and systemic responses in various clinical and non-clinical conditions. So this was one particular study. Again, it was related to that. But furthermore, they said that uh, well-designed uh, studies are needed 
to support the administration of bovine cholesterol in adult pediatric clinical and non-clinical settings it is still needed more studies are needed one paper that i came across in european journal of nutrition in august 2003 reported that an investigation of whether concentrated bovine cholesterol affected the incidence or duration of self reported symptoms of upper respiratory tract infections in adult males based on the self reports in a double blind placebo control study preliminary evidence was found that concentrated bovine cholesterol protein may enhance the resistance in the, to the development of symptoms of upper G, uh, respiratory tract infection coming back to our uh, point of understanding the various guidelines for icu patients aspen or society of critical care medicine 2016 guidelines to understand once again and reiterate on it it suggests determination of nutrient risk nutrition risk by using various screening tools uh, i would also suggest all of you to look at the iapn tool which has been come up recently for whom volitional intake is anticipated to be insufficient high nutrition risk identifies patients most likely to benefit from early enteral therapy nutrition therapy we also suggest that uh, nutritional assessment that includes an evaluation of comorbid conditions functions of gi tract and risk of aspiration no using traditional nutrition indications or surrogate markers uh, to uh, assess basically uh, i think there is no single surrogate marker for the same uh, suggest ic or indirect calorimetry to be used or maybe a published predictive equation or simplicist uh, simplicity weight based equation of 25 to 30 kilocalories per kg per day to be used to determine the energy requirements also suggest an ongoing evaluation of adequacy of proteins however 1.2 to 2 grams per kg per day is being advised may be higher in multi trauma or bonds patient initiate enteral nutrition within 24 to 48 hours of icu admission and preferred choice of use is enteral nutrition over parenteral nutrition in critically ill patients with high risk of aspiration uh, or intolerance to gastric enteral nutrition maybe the level of infusion should be diverted to low gi tract uh, which means post pylori suggest that uh, also it suggests that in case of hemodynamically unstable patients enteral nutrition should be withheld until the patient is fully stable and then it should be started with trophic or full nutrition by enteral nutrition uh, is appropriate in patients with ards or uh, acute liver uh, acute lung injury Uh, and those expected to have a duration of mechanical ventilation of more than 72 hours we need to be recommending trophic feeding or full nutrition by enteral nutrition patients with high risk nutrition risk should be advanced to reaching targets of more than 80% of the estimated energy and protein goals within the next uh, 48 to 72 hours in order to achieve um, benefits of enteral nutrition over the first week of hospitalization suggests also that in patients who are at a lower nutrition risk for example if the score nrs 2000 is more than equal to 3 uh, sorry less than equal to 3 or nutric score is less than equal to 5 exclusive exclusive parenteral nutrition should be withheld over the 7 days following icu admission if the patient cannot maintain volitional intake and if early enteral nutrition is not feasible key learnings that we need to take away today critically ill patients undergo many physiological and metabolic changes and uh, that result in impaired gi motility digestion or absorption such gi dysfunction often coupled with inadequate calorie intake leads to development of an energy deficit and obviously loss of lean body mass in such patients enteral nutrition should be started preferably within the first 24 to 48 hours and it should be considered even if 50 to 60 percent of nutrition targets are not met orally or adequately within the 72 hours of uh, oral nutritional support. Blenderized feeds definitely have limitations such as high microbial contamination, high osmolality, viscosity, and inconsistency in the amount and supply of nutrients. May be possibility of a blockage of the feeding tube as well. Therefore, scientific formula feeds are preferred over blenderized, and especially in the ICU setup. to meet the nutritional management goals critically ill patients need scientific formulas and uh, these formulas promote gi tolerance and deliver the specific nutrients that promote healing and help in better recovery and outcome of the patient these are my references thank you for a patient listening